What's up? It's Shannon from the Trinosphere, where Timmy, Johnny, and Spike battle over all things EDH. Today I'm here with Gavi, Nest Warden, the new Commander 2020 Legendary, and a deck tech I'm calling Gavi's Astral Approach. This is going to be a Johnny deck tech, so we're going to be looking at esoteric and underappreciated EDH cards, seeing if Gavi can elevate them into an impressive status. But if you're more interested in just good synergy staples and beating people to death, you'll probably be more interested in, in Timmy's deck techs. Or if you're more interested in competitive tier, lots of expensive mana rocks, lots of tutors, very consistent EDH decks, you might be more interested in Spike deck techs. So be sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notifications when deck techs by Timmy and Spike come out based on other legendary creatures from Commander 2020. But let's talk about Gabi Nest Warden. This 5 mana 2 5 human shaman says, well you may pay 0 rather than pay the cycling cost of the first card you cycled each turn. Notice it says each turn, not just your turn, so the first card you cycle on opponent's turns costs 0 as well. Whenever you draw your second card each turn, create a 2 2 red and white dino cat creature token a dino cat really like hounds and wolves are still split but they're like cats get all the love i see how it is watsy anyways uh this also says each turn so if we manage to draw two cards on each opponent's turn that means we create another 2-2 on their turn as well so gavi has is very scalable and i'm pretty excited to play around with this new legendary so this deck is called astral approach because we're going to be using approach of the second sun as a primary win con so this seven mana sorcery says if it was cast from your hand and another spell named approach was cast at this game you win the game. Otherwise, put me uh, in your library, seven from the top, and you gain seven life. So if you've successfully cast Approach twice in the same game, you win the game. And when you first cast it, it's put seven from the top. So there's six cards between you, between your first approach and your second approach. We're going to be looking at ways to get through those six cards that exist between Approach 1 and Approach 2. And Gabby's really good at doing that because Gabby makes, you know, it's going to be a cycling deck. So almost all of our cards are cantrips and they're going to be really cheap cantrips. So it'll be really easy to shred those those six cards between approach one and approach two. But some cards that help us includes Curator of Mysteries, Fluctuator, and New Perspectives. Curator of Mysteries, a four mana four four flying sphinx says whenever you cycle or discard a card, scry one, and then you can cycle me for a blue. So when this card's in play and we're between approach one and approach two, uh, we can then cycle cards and then of course that'll trigger Curator to scry one, and then we can bottom whatever card we scry, because it doesn't matter. And that'll help us go twice as, we'll, we'll dig twice as fast. So uh, this card's very useful, and of course it's, you you know, early game, it's just a cantrip. It's a single blue draw card. We also have Fluctuator and New Perspectives. Both discount our cycle spells so that our spike cycle spells can be effectively zero and we can di we can shred through those six cards and get to approach two as fast as possible. Fluctuator discounts them by a flat two. Well, most of the cards in this deck are two generic, so this makes them zero. But there are some cards in this deck that are three and some that are one of a specific color. So Fluctuator doesn't hit all of them, but it hits a good chunk of them. New Perspectives, however, is a six mana enchantment that says when I eat TB draw three, and if you have seven or more cards in your hand, you can pay zero instead of other cycling costs. So it just overrides cycling costs and makes them zero, but it requires you have seven cards in hand. If you have five cards in your hand and one of them's new perspectives, you're good to go. You cast new perspectives, you go down to four cards in hand, but new perspectives draws you three, you're back up to seven, and let the cycling begin. So some other ways that we're going to dig through, find our approach, and then get from approach one to approach two as fast as possible is through astral sliding. And if you guys are familiar with that card, astral slide is an OG enchantment, but it's been reprinted a few times in different forms, including Astral Drift and now the new Escape Protocol, which I'm very excited for. So Astral Slide originally was a three minute enchantment that says, whenever you cycle a card, you may exile target creature. And if you do, return that creature to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So it flickers cards and it can flicker opponent's creatures too. This card is really good at dissuading attacks. If you're gonna come at me with a Blight Steel, I'm going to cycle a card and flicker it out and it's gonna come back into play later and it's not gonna have been attacking. So you can use this politically to, to as a defensive measure, but you can also use it to re-trigger your own ETB effect. So you can cycle and flicker out one of your creatures and have it come back into play and trigger a second time. So we're going to really abuse that. So Astral Drift is a new iteration. This is three mana enchantment. It has basically the same ability, but it has cycling itself. So you can cycle Astral Drift. And if you do, you get to trigger its effect once. So you can cycle Astral Drift. And when you do, you exile target creature and put it back into the play under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end. So this can be used very usefully to defend Gavi from being removed. If they decide to kill Gavi because they realize how much value you're generating, use Astral Drift to protect Gavi from removal. Just, I'm going to cycle Astral Drift and flicker Gavi out, thus negating a removal spell. But let's talk about the new good good, Escape Protocol. I'm really excited for this one. This two-minute enchantment says, whenever you cycle a card, you may pay one. So right off the bat, it kind of sounds worse than Astral Slide and Drift because it costs mana in addition to cycling. But it says, 
When you do, exile target artifact or, or creatures, but it, it is only creatures and artifacts you control. Return it to the battlefield under its owner's control full stop. Not at the end of the beginning of the next end step or whatever. This puts the card directly back into play immediately, which gives me a little Johnny Chubb because this card is abusable. You can do the same creature in as many times as you can afford to in a single turn. With Astral Slide and Drift, you have to basically wait until the end step before you can use the same creature a second time. With Escape Protocol, nah. If you have mana, if you have cycling cards in hand, you can do the same creature as, as many times as you can until you run out of one of those resources. And we're going to talk about how not to run out of those resources next. And next, we're going to talk about Astral Ramping or ways to generate mana while you're Astral Sliding or Escape Protocoling. You have Cloud of Fairies, Dockside Extortionist, Peregrine Drake, and Priest of Urubras. All of these cards either untap lands or generate mana or treasures whenever we slide or escape these cards specifically. Dockside Extortionist is amazing for this. I don't know how your playgroup is, but very frequently a Dockside Extortionist will generate six or seven treasures. And in the more competitive environments, it can generate upwards of 12 treasures every time it ETBs. Well, well, gee, if you generate 12 treasures every time this ETBs and you have escape protocol in play, you basically have infinite mana, right? You can keep flickering him and just cycling a card, flicker him again, cycle a card, flicker him again and then you're just generating so many treasures that it's going to be out of hand very quickly. One of the things we need to be able to do is when we're sliding is to draw into more cycle cards, cards that we can cycle to trigger your astral slides and your escape protocols. So we have some creatures or targets for astral slide that draws cards, including Mole Drifter, Spellpire, Phoenix, Toothy, Imaginary Friend, and Wall of Omens. So Mole Drifter and Wall of Omens are very classically, I ETB, I draw cards. So as many times as you can make me ETB, I can draw you a card. I do like Mole Drifter because it has Evoke, and if, you're, if you've played around with Evoke, a little bit before, uh, you do know that it is an ETB trigger that's created to sacrifice this creature. So, Muldred throw a 5 mana 2-2 two, two flyer when I ETB draw 2 cards, but you can evoke me for 3 mana, and when I, and if you do, you must sacrifice me when I ETB. The sacrificing is an is a second ETB effect that's created, which means you can maintain priority and override it with a new effect. For example, you evoke Muldred into play, it comes into play, it creates 2 ETB triggers. One says draw 2 cards, one says sacrifice Muldrifter. You go, you go, okay, I'll draw the 2 cards, then I'll maintain priority, and then I'll Astral Slide Mold Drifter out of into exile. Now its second ability, Sacrifice Mold Drifter, basically fizzles because Mold Drifter is not in play anymore. And then at the end of the turn, Mold Drifter comes back into play, draws you two cards, and no longer has that Evoke clause triggering it to sacrifice. So it's a way to cheat around Evoke. Uh, and you can play around that a lot more. There's some other good Evoke creatures like Ingot Chewer. And, but more importantly is Toothy Imaginary Friend, which is b bananas with Escape Protocol. This 4 mana 1 1 says, whenever you draw a card, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on me. And then when I leave the battlefield, draw a card for each plus one plus one counter on me. Now this is kind of insane with escape protocol because of the way this works. If you escape protocol Toothy exiling it, he creates an LTB trigger, goes on the stack, says draw X where X is the number of plus one plus counters on me. Let's just say that X was four. So I had four counters on me when, when, when you escape protocoled me. So now you're going to draw four cards. That triggers on the stack. But we need to resolve all of escape protocol's effect before we move on and try and do another ability on the stack. So escape protocol says you've exiled it. Now put it back into play right now. Okay, so we put a Toothy back into play. Now we're done with Escape Protocol's ability. So Toothy's now in play, but its LTB trigger is still in the stack. And so we're going to resolve its LTB trigger and draw four cards. And now guess what? Toothy just saw you draw four cards. Put four counters back on Toothy. So it's effectively like the Escape Protocol and Toothy kind of combo to just draw just raw cards as fast as you can. You just keep flickering it and you just keep drawing cards. It doesn't get smaller. It doesn't reset. It in fact starts getting bigger over time. So this is a really cool combo. I love Escape Protocol and Toothy's kind of a really great example of how to abuse that. So let's move on to the beats package. We're talking a lot about Approach of the Second Sun, Astral Sliding as a way to, to tear through those six cards between Approach 1 and Approach 2, or to find Approach in your deck. But if, if that's failing, if people know about Approach, people counter it or whatever, they, you know, some some jerk who searched your deck and exiled it or whatever, we can uh, we can pivot to a different win con, and that is an, another new card that I'm excited to play around with called Herald of the Forgotten. This 8 mana 6 6 flying cat B says, when I ATB, if you cast me, return any number of target permanent cards with cycling from graveyard to the battlefield. Field. This is basically a white living death. It returns all of the permanents in our graveyard that had cycling to the battlefield when it's resolves. Really cool card. Uh, I'm really excited to play around with this. And of course, the first thoughts came to mind, I just said, is it's kind of like living death, right? So, you know, you can play around maybe more of a Timmy build is focusing on just cycling and putting cards as many bodies into the graveyard as fast as you can. And then finding your Herald of the Forgotten and putting them all into play, maybe with haste, and then just one-shotting people out of nowhere, which is kind of really cool. But in here, 
here. It'll just be in the, kind of another value generator, and I'll talk a little bit more about all the cool different things Harold can bring back. But for right now, we'll just talk about some of the big bodies that fill out kind of the uh, the chaff of the deck. Basically, these are just cantrips in my mind, but they have upside and that they can become a small army if need be. You have things like Dra Draneth Stinger, Eternal Dragon, Glass Dust Hulk, and Granitic Titan. So a lot of these are just easy cantrips. You can cycle them, but you know, if you resolve a Herald of Forgotten, it gives you a good amount of power on board. And a lot of these are evasive, and you want to have evasive ones because we run Reconnaissance Mission, which is kind of like coastal piracy. If we hit a player with a creature, we get a draw card. So we want a lot of evasive bodies, if if possible. We're also going to run Quickfoot Cyclops, Shimmer Scale Drake, Viashino Sand Sprinter, and Windcaller Aven. So another set of decently aggressive bodies, none of which we'd ever really want to hard cast per se. We'd always want to cycle these cards, but they have upside in that if we resolve a Herald of the Forgotten, we get a little bit of an army. Speaking of armies, we can also go with the token strategy. So this could be another Timmy build of this deck. It would be more focused on this token strategy rather than, you know, the approach strategy. You have cards like Drake Haven, Ominous Seas, Shark Typhoon, and Valiant Rescuer. All these cards are really good in the cycling deck, able to generate, some of them generate evasive flying flyers, some of them generate giant eight eights, and some of them generate uh, small one ones. However, all of them are very cost effective. Shark Typhoon's a really cool one. The six man enchantment says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create an XX flying shark where X is the CMC of that spell. So this makes all of your uh, mana rocks get a 2-2 two, two, uh, two, two flyer in addition. However, it also has cycle me for X and two to create an XX flying shark. So you can actually cycle this early game and make a flying creature at, at instant speed, which is kind of cool. And Valiant Rescuer in this deck is like probably a more effective young pyromancer. This two minute three one says whenever you cycle a card for the first time each turn, create a one one human creature token. So this combos so well with Gavi. On each and every player's turn, you're gonna cycle once for free and each and every time you do that, you get a 1-1. One, one. So easy to make four 1-1s one, by the time it goes all the way around the board. So Valiant Rescue will create a army very quickly. And then Ominous Seas is in here. That's two mana enchantment. Whenever you draw a card, put a foreshadow counter on me, remove eight counters to create an 8-8 eight, eight Kraken. So this is obviously way better in, in Simic decks because you get access to greater good, which is like an insane combo with Ominous Seas. But I'm still going to run it in here um, as a cool little like a way to aggress people or dissuade attacks, should back the hell off. Uh, these seas be ominous. So if you're a Timmy and you're looking more towards a token strategy, you're more excited about that, I'd recommend, you know, Ominous Seas being, is a very good card, but I also recommend like Anointed Procession and focusing on doubling your, your token production and other cards like Im Improbable Alliance and Locust God, all really good in this deck at creating a lots of flyer, evasive tokens very quickly. Moving on to ramp removal and draw. We're gonna have a lot of ramp in this deck because we have a seven and eight mana uh, win conditions uh, through Approach and Herald. We also also can use a lot of extra mana in the form of cycling as cantrips. So uh, extra mana is not an issue, so we're going to have plenty of different uh, sources of mana in this deck. So we have Azorius, Boros, Izzet, and Arcane Signet. We're going to have all the Talismans, including Talisman of Conviction, Creativity, and Progress, as well as Soul Ring. We're also going to run Commander Sphere and Rargren Crystal. Smothering Tithe uh, is going to be in this deck, uh, giving us extra mana. So it works really well with Gavi, because of course Gavi makes the first card we cycle on opponent's turns free. Smothering Tithe also gives us um, effectively gives us a mana on each of our opponent's turns to then try and cycle a second card. We really want to draw two cards per turn, so Gavi makes a 2 2 Dino Cat. Of course, the first one's free through Gavi, and Smothering Tithe helps us cycle that second one on each player's turn. Surely Badger Soar is a really cool card. It's like a red bone miser. This four mana 3 3 Badger Dinosaur says whenever you discard a creature card, put a plus one plus encounter on me. Whenever you discard a land card, create a treasure. And whenever you discard a non creature non land card, I can fight up to one creature you don't control. So removal, beater, but most importantly, makes treasures every time we discard a land. There are 10 cycle lands in here. Lands that can be cycled. So that's already 10 different ways that Surly can generate treasure. But on top of that, we run things like Tectonic Reformation. This enchantment for two mana gives all lands in our hand cycle for a red. So Surly Badrasaur and Tectonic Reformation are a bit of a combo. All of our lands now have cycle me for a red. And every time you cycle me, you get a treasure which can be sacked to make red mana. That's kind of a combo right there. You can basically tear through all the lands in your hand and every land you top deck is basically free to cycle, triggering all of your different cycle effects and uh, being able to dig real deep really fast with these two cards in play. Lastly, we have Vizier of Tumbling Sands. Uh, this uh, is a older cycle card. This three minute one three can tap to untap target permanent, but more importantly, you can cycle Vizier to untap target permanent. So anytime, anytime you see a card that says, when you cycle me, do something good, it's probably gonna be included. They're all very good. And this one can untap either a soul ring or a land that taps for two mana like Azorius Chancery. So this can ramp us early game pretty easily. 
or it can be used to give a creature vigilance effectively. So on to removal. For our sweepers, we've got a Chroma's Vengeance and Dismantling Wave. Both of these cards are a little tricky to use in this deck. Uh, Chroma's Vengeance for six mana, destroy all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments, or cycle me for three. But we have a lot of artifacts and enchantments in this deck, so more often than not, you're gonna cycle a Chroma's Vengeance, but it is there in a pinch. If things get real bad, you have an oh shit button that can clear the whole board state. Similarly, Dismantling Wave is a new card. Uh, three mana, sorcery, for each opponent, destroy up to one target artifact or, or enchantment that player controls. Sounds really great off the bat. It's sorcery speed, so it's not excellent, but you know, being able to disenchant each opponent is pretty sweet. It's a good three for one. But it has eight mana cycling ability that says, when you cycle me, destroy all artifacts and enchantments. So it's a very weird, unique card. One of the first I've ever seen where the cycling cost is greater than its casting cost because the cycle effect is more powerful than the hard cast effect. But once again, the problem here is that we have a lot of artifacts and enchantments. So cycling this is a sketch do at your own risk scenario. But I should note, Cycling has no timing restrictions, so we can cycle on opponent's turns, and Gavi makes it very easy to do so. It makes our cycling cost zero on opponent's turns. So Dismantling Wave is very good at preventing us from losing the game. Or more importantly, it's really good at preventing certain players from winning the game. If they're about to go off using some artifact or enchantment synergy, we can force zero mana, cycle Dismantling Wave, and by the way, it's not a spell cast. They can't counter our cycle. They can only counter, they can only like stifle the triggered ability caused by us cycling. We can cycle Dismantling Wave to destroy all artifacts effects and enchantments right in the middle of them going off and they're like oh crap I didn't see that coming and I couldn't stop it so dismantling wave has upside but it's once again these cards are a little tricky to use so uh, keep that in mind we do have a much easier to use star storm this x red red instance says deal x damage to each creature and cycle me for three and I like this in here because Gavi has five toughness so star storm can be you know set up to x equals four so it doesn't kill Gavi it kills everything smaller than Gavi uh, maybe some of our tokens but Gavi is still standing near the end or you know if, if we need it to we can scale it all the way up to X equals seven to bring down, you know, bigger creatures. For spot removal, we got cast out, neutralize, swords to plowshares, and forsake the worldly. Most of these you can see are just cycle spells that are actual removal spells in a pinch. Neutralize is a cool new one. It's just a, it's a cancel that has cycle me for two. And swords to plowshares is a staple. I always run that, so. But if we want some more unique Johnny-esque removal spells, we have countervailing winds and zenith flare, two cards that are kind of our cycle-centric removal spells. Countervailing winds says counter target spell unless its owner pays one for each card in our graveyard. So this three mana instant is kind of like a worse neutralize, but it's easier to cast. And once again, it has cycling. So it's also going to gonna supplement neutralize as a card in the deck. And then Zenith Flare is the new, I'm sure some people have come across it in Arena if you're playing that, is a giant lightning helix. This four mana instant says deal X damage and gain X life, uh, where X is the number of cards with cycling in your graveyard. So very often when I cast this, uh, there's six cards with cycling in my graveyard. So it's dealing six and we're gaining six, but you can wait till a little bit later in the game and actually just end somebody with Zenith Flare, which is really funny. Just do like tw 12 to their face and they die. We're also going to run Remand because it is really good with Approach of the Second Sun. When we cast Approach for the first time, we can remand it back to our hand and draw a card. And then we're ready. We're just ready to win the game next turn. If we, or you know, if we happen to have still have seven mana somehow, we can do it right now. But more than likely, we're going to remand it back to our hand and pass and then see if anyone can stop us from casting it on the following turn. Because of course, Approach, when we cast it the second time, only checks to see if we cast it before. Doesn't check to see if it resolved before. All we had to do have tried to cast it. Doesn't matter if it resolved. Resolved. And then the second time we cast Approach, it says, oh, you tried to cast me before? Good enough. You win the game. For some free counter spells, we're going to use Fierce Guardianship, Nimble Obstructionist, and Decree of Silence. Fierce Guardianship, thankfully, comes in this pre-con. So if you bought this pre-con, you're in great shape. Otherwise, it's outrageously expensive. But the, all of these cards are very good. The free to cast when your commander's in play cards are all bananas. So this one's a negate. It's three mana, counter target, non-creature spell. But I'm free if, you're, if your commander's in play. So very good card. The Nimble Obstructionist is a pretty cool one. Three mana, three, one flash flying bird wizard cycle me for three and if you do counter target activated or triggered ability you don't control so this is really good it's kind of our only out against like fast as oracle win cons but it's really a cool card you, generally speaking gavi is going to make this cycle for zero and we have a way to stifle effects for for free and then finally we have decree of silence which is the you know the big boogeyman other than decree of annihilation which i'm not recommending you play unless your play group is cool with that decree of silence is also a pretty big boogeyman when it comes to cycling or solemnity and all this nonsense this uh enchantment can be cycled for six 
to counter a spell. And so hopefully Gavi means cycled is for zero to counter a spell is hopefully what we're gonna be using it as. But if Decree of Silence somehow manages to resolve and become a enchantment on the battlefield, it's a eight mana enchantment that says, uh, whenever an opponent plays a spell, counter that spell and put a depletion counter on Decree of Silence. If there are three or more depletion counters on Decree of Silence, sacrifice it. So if you wanna build a generic deck, you build Solemnity Decree of Silence so that of course Solemnity prevents these depletion counters from being put on Decree of Silence. So if Decree of Silence manages to land on the battlefield, opponents can't cast spells anymore. They, all, they are all getting automatically countered. But a really cool way to put Decree of Silence into play in this deck is off of that Herald of the Forgotten. Herald of the Forgotten says, put all permanents with cycling from graveyard into play. So this, not just creatures, and this is an enchantment. So this is a really good way when you resolve your Herald of the Forgotten to put an army in the battlefield. You know, you got like 20, 30 power on board, but you also manage to stick a Decree of Silence in there. So that Decree of Silence comes into play and gives him an umbrella protection and counters the first three spells your opponents try and fling your way. We've gone to draw. So these are some cards to help supplement the fact that almost all of our deck is cantrips, but we want to refill our hand because we're going to be jumping, we're going to be dumping artifacts onto play, some mana rocks, and we're going to be dumping lands. So we're going to get down to like two or three cards in hand. We need to fill back up, especially because new perspectives makes all of our cycling cost zero if we have seven cards in our hand. So we want to keep as close to seven as possible for as long as we can. We're going to use Mystic Remora and Ristic Study, of course. I've been playing a little bit more online against other play groups and wow, other play groups do not pay for Ristic Study. It blows my mind. So if you can't beat them, I'm going to join them. And of course, both of these can be brought back with Sun Titan, which we run in here. So both of these cards are really good, really annoying for our opponents and really good for us. We're going to be running Reconnaissance Mission, which usually we're just going to cycle away. This four mana enchantment says whenever a creature we control deals combat damage to a player, we draw a card. So it's Coastal Piracy or, or by Nathasa. And it can be cycled for two. But uh, we're generally not an aggressive strategy that will use this, but we do generate a lot of tokens. So we can use this kind of more of a burst draw spell. Be like, oh, wow, I guess I have uh, nine humans on board and you have two blockers. I want to cast Reconnaissance Mission and swing and draw, you know, seven cards right here and right now. It works well with Drake Haven and Shark Typhoon, which make flyers as well. So it's uh, more for the token centric strategy, which we still have elements of here. So we're going to use it. We talked about Tectonic Reformation in conjunction with Shirley Badger Soar. Tectonic Reformation, of course, gives all of our lands sight for a red when Surly Badasaur is kind of a combo in that it gives us a treasure every time we cycle. So this helps us shred through all of our lands and get to our good stuff as fast as possible. Finally, we have Boon of the Wish Giver. This six mana sorcery says draw four or cycle me for one. I, that, that's a tough cost to swallow. Six mana to draw four is not something I'm ever really looking for unless I have a lot of cost reduction. But uh, this card is most often just cycled early game. It sometimes comes up in late game that it is valuable to have in your graveyard. Like you'll run out of gas, you'll be able to astral slide your Spellpire Phoenix, and you're like, man, you're looking for something in your grave. Oh, shoot, there's a, there's a Boon of the Wish Giver in here. I will return that to my hand and cast it for six, because I have a bunch of mana, I have a bunch of treasure laying around, and draw four, and now I'm back in the game. I draw, I drew some cycling cards, I'm back in it. So this card, uh, it still makes the cut. Speaking of Spellpire Phoenix, there are some really good recursion cards in here, because I guess that's kind of one of the uh, Cycle Tribe's secondary synergies, is, is recursion, of course, because we're putting stuff in the graveyard at will. So we're going to be running Abandoned Sarcophagus, Amaria Shepherd, Sun Titan and Rooting Moloch. Uh, Abandoned Sarcophagus, of course, comes with a precon. It's a really good card. This three mana artifact says uh, we can cast non land cards with cycling from our graveyard. Ba basically, gives all of our cycling cards flashback in our graveyard because it says if a card was cycling would be put in our graveyard from anywhere and it was not cycled, exile it instead. It kind of is like it's kind of like flashback. If we do cast a card from our graveyard that has cycling, it will become exiled the next time it hits the graveyard. Amaria Shepherd is a pet card of mine. The seven mana four four flying angel has landfall put a non-land permanent from graveyard to hand but if that land was a plains instead put it on the battlefield generally speaking you want it to be a plains like this card is great it just puts permanents from graveyard directly into play every time you play a planes. Awesome card. But ironically in this deck, more often than not, I'm hoping it's not a planes. I'm hoping for a non planes because we're going to be putting permanents from our graveyard to our hand. Those permanents had cycling on them and I want to cycle them. You know, instead of uh, putting like a, a five, four with menace into play, I'd rather have it go to my hand and I could cycle it, trigger all my different effects. So for once, a Mary Shepherd being used to put cards in hand rather than play. Sun Titan, of course, hits a ton of great permanents in our deck. We talked about Mystic Remora and Mystic Study. Hits Astral Slide pieces like Astral Slide or Dockside Extortionist Wall of Omens, some of those pieces that we want to target when we're sliding. And then uh, and then lastly, Rooting Moloch. It's kind of like Spellpire Phoenix. Exile target card with a cycling ability from your graveyard, and until end of your next turn, you may play that card. So it's kind of one of those like bad red draws, where you have a limited window in which to use that card. It has a wider range of targets than Spellpire. Spellpire Phoenix can only hit instances of sorceries, where Rooting Moloch can hit any card with cycling, so it can hit artifacts. It can even hit lands, because it says, until the end of your next turn, you may play that card, not cast it. So you can actually play lands off of Rooting Moloch, and then of course it can 
Mountain Dew enchantments as well. So Rooting Moloch has a little bit more reach, but a little narrower usage uh, profile, but still worth running both. All right, that wraps up this Gobby's Astral Approach list based around Approach of the Second Sun and using Astral Slide. Uh, I've never been able to use Astral Slide or Drift, and now Escape Protocols, uh, another option. I'm super excited to try out a deck with this. Let me know what you guys think. Is this too Johnny, too Deep Dive? Would you rather have gone for something more mainstream? Um, or would you rather have been like more of a Timmy and went with a token token beats or a spike and just said, screw all this stuff. I'm going to use a, a consistent combo that has already been established to be solid and then jam as many mana rocks in here, jam as many tutors in here as I can afford, you know, that kind of thing. Let me know what you think. This is a lot of fun to build and I'm excited to be playing it online. So be sure to uh, follow us on Twitter, especially, or maybe Facebook because I'm going to try and play this against other people on the web. It's a lot harder for us as the Trinisphere to get together and record our YouTube gameplays that you may be used to. So we're going to try and branch out more into the web world and get some games. And so you may see this deck being played against other content creators. All right, this is Shannon the Johnny signing off. Great minds and feel alike.